you, Brother Patrick. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. And such a warm fellowship here this morning. Thank you for uh, just your warm welcome. This is a little bit about myself. I um, was born in, born in Hong Kong. I immigrated to the United States in, the, in 1977. Some of you may not be born yet at that time. And so my parents moved to San Francisco. I uh, grew up in San Francisco and went to um, graduate from college and went and started working for about 20 years, you know, doing various tech-related stuff. And God called me into ministry. And so I've been serving um, at Arise Church. Um, it's a church in Fremont for about 13 years. And then I took a break. I thought that was the end of my ministry. And then God says, no. I'm going to call you back to the church where you first learned about me in San Francisco. And that's a Cumberland Presbyterian Chinese church in Chinatown. Some of you may know where it is. And uh, so I've been serving there for a little over a year now. And uh, it's wonderful to be back as, at the church where I grew up and be able to minister there. So uh, this morning, yeah, I'm going to kind of meditate and think about uh, just the idea of sharing the gospel. The idea of just uh, going, take, go, going on, just about missions, what it means for us to be missionaries, both, both locally as well as abroad. So before we begin, let's bow, bow our heads and let's just pray and lift up this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you. First of all, I know um, Stockton Chinese Baptist Church, the English congregation is thinking about this year, the theme of your word. And indeed, Father, we are so thankful for the scripture because you've revealed yourself to us that way. And we can draw close to you and learn about you through your word. They are precious. They're like a light before us. And God, I just pray that now would you dwell in our midst. Holy Spirit, would you open our hearts to you as we meditate on your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let me show you a picture first. Uh, must have gone the wrong way. So this is a picture of, um, I, went, I, I was on a short-term mission trip to Lebanon. So you can see uh, the, the group, um, we, have, we have a group picture over there on the upper uh, left con corner. We took that picture uh, outside of Tyre Church. So Tyre, if you remember in scripture, there's, there's a city called Tyre and Sidon in Lebanon. That's where we were. We were at Tyre. And... Um, this church is, uh, they, they have a very interesting ministry. It's called 10,000 Lighthouses. And the idea, the vision is to plant lighthouses all over the Middle East in various Muslim communities and neighborhoods. Okay? So the whole idea is for these lighthouses to serve the neighborhood, just to love them. And, and through the process of loving them, introduce Jesus Christ and the gospel to them. And so we got a chance to visit one of those lighthouses in the city of Tyre. And um, I can't show you the exterior because I don't want to expose their location. I don't want people to, be, to recognize it. So I took, I'm showing you pictures of the interior. And you can see that inside there are, um, they have, this, uh, they have uh, a nursery. In, in, it's, it's essentially a community center. So they have a, a nursery. They have a, a beauty school. And they also have a, a bake, baking school as well as a gymnasium. So the whole idea here is to uh, really to help the, the women. Because um, you know, in a Muslim society, women are um, usually the... the um, they're, it's a patriarchal society, right? So women is a little lower class. Uh, but the economy in Lebanon is, is, is not doing well. And so even women have to, to start working. And so by running these schools, they're able to teach women some useful skills to find work. And, in, and running these nurseries at a very low cost will help them drop off their kids so that they could go to work, right? Um, but this particular lighthouse is located in a neighborhood that's Rubai Hezbollah. You guys recognize that name? Hezbollah is a, 
extreme Islamic group, okay, a militant Islamic group. In fact, um, many local, both both within the, the the country of Lebanon as well as outside, uh, terrorist attacks both within and outside, were done by this particular group. And they're even called a state within a state. That's how powerful they are in Lebanon. And they, they control this particular neighborhood. Okay. In other words, they are the law here. So we were there, and within 10 minutes of arriving to this lighthouse, three big guys in black came into the community center, right? And they started to talk to the pastor's wife. The pastor, the entire church pastor, didn't go with us. His wife took us on this tour, right? So uh, he was talking to, to the pastor's wife. The pastor wasn't there at the time. And we could sense the atmosphere just change. Like it, was, it got so intense all of a sudden. And uh, as we walked around this community center, these two gentlemen, they were kind of following us behind with their arms folded like this, right? And they would stand right next to us. Where, wherever we stopped, they would just stand right next to us, you know? And um, so we... We did this tour pretty quickly. <laughs> we got into the van, and by then, someone had notified the pastor. The pastor drove up, and he got into the van with us, and he just wanted to make sure that we got out of that neighborhood safely. And do you know why? There are two things that, the he that Hezbollah hates. Number one, they hate Americans. And number two, they hate Christians. And guess who we were? Americans and Christians, we got them both. I think the, 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 only, <laughs> the only lucky thing, or to say that by God's grace, I think in their mind, I don't think they, they associate Americans with you know, Asian looking faces. So we, we're somehow, we somehow managed to get out of there okay. But you know what? This lighthouse is really like a, really a, a gospel center in the middle of enemy's territory. Doesn't it feel like that? Right? It's in the middle of enemies territory like we we're stepping into enemies zone and often we think like okay if i if i go outside of the united states we go to another country to do to do mission work then we're entering enemies territory and we rarely think that you know what we are actually in a battleground a battle zone every day every day Anywhere where, the, where, there, where there's still a need for the gospel, it's a battleground, including the United States. When we walk out, it, we, 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 as we work with, go to school with, our neighbors and, and so forth, people don't know if, there any, if there's anybody who doesn't know the gospel message, that's a battleground. But we often don't think that way. And perhaps the reason why it doesn't feel that way, maybe, is because we choose to disengage. And if we disengage, it doesn't feel like a fight, does it? And so today, I th we're going to, um, as Brother Patrick read, we're going to learn what the Lord had, had uh, faced the minute he started to do ministry, right? and learn from him some of the things that we need to take to heart as we think about going on mission, sharing the gospel with the people around us. I mean, not be far away. Maybe it's very close. So, uh, yeah, the message today is the three spiritual battles of evangelism. So let's dive right in. And I'm reading from the ESV. I'm sorry, I'm not using your translation, but... Hopefully, you, it's okay with you. So uh, let's take the first four, four verses. It says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the, the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So let's unpack this for a minute. We know Jesus Christ is truly human and truly God, right? Fully human and fully God. Now, his humanity 
He experienced the same things we experience. He has this. He has similar. He has similar needs. So he's been fasting for forty days. I think he's hungry. <laughs> so what do you do when you're hung? You get hungry. You eat. You eat, right? And、uh, so let me ask you guys a question. How many of you have actually gotten up in the middle of the night, like say midnight? You're a little hungry. So you go downstairs, or you go into your kitchen, and you grab yourself a box of cereal, or maybe a cookie, or maybe a bag, bag uh, uh, maybe a packet of instant noodle, and you make yourself a late night snack. How many have done that? Yeah, thank you, man. That's right. We all we all do it, right? So I'm going to ask you a second question. How many of you feel guilty for doing that? <laughs> you go. I, I I feel pretty bad. You know, I shouldn't be eating so late at night. You know, and I shouldn't be eating something so so healthy. You know, like a chocolate chip cookie or something like that. So let me ask you a question: How many of you feel guilty because, oh my gosh, I sin against the Lord? This atrocious sin of eating in the middle of the night. How many of you feel that way? Rarely. Why? Because eating is not a sin, is it? Eating is not a sin. It's not a sin. So, and Jesus, he's been fasting for forty days. He's hungry. He needed to eat. And even if he ate, it's not a sin. Now, furthermore, let me ask you guys a question. So, the devil is tempting, tempting Jesus here. How many piece? How many stones did he ask Jesus to turn into bread? How many stones? Just one. Turn one stone. Into one piece of bread to satisfy your hunger. Jesus, the devil is not even tempting Jesus to peg out, to gorge himself. You turn all these stones into a massive meal and enjoy yourself. He didn't even. It's not even. It's not about even about gluttony. He's just ask, asking Jesus, "You're hungry. Turn one stone. Feed yourself. Satisfy your hunger." So what's the temptation? What's the sin? The answer comes from how Jesus answered the devil. Jesus used Deuteronomy chapter eight. He says, "It is written, 'Man shall not live by bread alone.'" But let's take a look at the context. In Deuteronomy chapter eight, let's start from verse two. It says, "And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these forty years in the wilderness, that He, the, that God, might humble you." That God might humble you, that God might might test you to know what was in your heart, humble you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. That He might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So the context here is the story of Exodus. The Israelites they're wandering in the wilderness. They had not. They have nothing to eat, and God says, "No worries. Every morning, I'm going to provide manna for you. You get up, and they'll be there for you every day except for Sabbath." God's word of promise, of provision. And here, God is the one who's testing. Is testing them. Hey, look. Are you going to have in your heart my promise and my promise to provide for you, or are you going to care and be concerned about the needs of your flesh? Are you going to have in your heart? Are you going to set apart my promise for you above your own needs and desires? There's another way to put that. You know that it's called denying yourself. Are you able to deny yourself? That's Satan's test. That's Satan's test.、And、you guys remember、um, in Matthew chapter sixteen, verse twenty-four, Jesus says, "If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me." Jesus was fasting, right, right before this. You know that fasting, the spiritual practice of fasting, really is a practice, an exercise of denying yourself. Satan's telling Jesus, 
Don't deny yourself. Stop denying yourself. Now, can you imagine this? You guys remember that Jesus had to go on the cross? And do you remember the night of his betrayal when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? The scripture says he was praying so hard that his sweat looked like blood flowing down from him. He was really wrestling at that moment. So imagine if saying God Jesus to deny himself, to stop denying himself for a piece of bread, what can Satan do before the cross? He would have foiled the entire salvation plan. The first thing we can remember when we enter the battleground of sharing the gospel is we got to deny ourselves. We got to learn to deny ourselves. Let me, let me share with some stories with you at Lebanon. I met a lot of missionaries in Lebanon that practice denying ourselves. Um, here's this picture of um, me having dinner with three Syrian young men. I blur their faces so that you won't recognize them. They won't, at least the internet won't recognize them, hopefully. So uh, three Syrian young men, they're all Christians, okay? And um, one of them, I want to tell you um, the story of Fadi. Fadi is the guy on the left. Uh, Fadi has a very interesting ministry. Syria is right next to Lebanon. So they're, they're, they're neighboring countries. They're separated by a mountain range. And you, you may know, in the, in the, uh, for the past decade or so, Syria has been in a civil war. So a lot of refugees fled the country, crossed the mountain range into Lebanon. And in Lebanon, there is a valley called Baca Valley. It's a beautiful place. But that's where a lot of refugees end up staying. And they stayed in these tent cities, essentially. And you can see, this is me walking through one of them. It's just tents on top of mud, basically, right? And so Fadi has this wonderful ministry where he and his team got, to, got uh, purchased a van, and they put uh, washing machines in the vans, in the van. And they, 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 would, they would drive from one tent city to the next, right? Offering laundry services. And you know, a lot of moms are, you know, it's, it's the life of them. So they, they would come out, they'll bring their dirty laundry. They'll also bring their little kids. They'll come out and allow Fadi and his team to wash their clothes. And so while they're waiting for their laundry, Fadi and his team will come out and they would do this puppet show, right? And through the puppet show, they will share the gospel with, with the families. And the kids love it. And the moms loved it too. And so they, they look forward to them coming every, every time. Until one time, they were at this one particular uh, tent city. And while they were doing all of this, these guys came out with machine guns. And they pointed the machine gun in, the, in his head. And they were going to shoot him. Body said he, he thought he was going to die that day. Because they said, you are a Syrian, and you are a Christian. You betray Islam. That's a death sentence. They were, they were about to shoot him. And for some reason, he managed to escape. Okay, their team somehow got out. They got in their car, and they drove out of that particular tent city. And the minute that they that the tents didn't disappear from sight. They started praising God. They were shouting and singing. They were praising and worshiping God. And then they headed for the next tent city. That's denying yourself, isn't it? They're denying even to their own life. They're willing to lay down their life for the gospel. Denying yourself. At Tire Church, the pastor there, when we were visiting, he said this to our team. He says, Christians should not give in to the Muslims, but fight them with the love of Christ. Fight them with what? With the love of Christ. And expect persecution. I think the pastor at Tired Church, 
gave us a definition of denying ourselves. All we need to do is just replace the word Muslim with a blank. And we get to fill in the blank. Christians should love blank. Should love blank. Should not give in to the blank, but fight them with the love of Christ and expect persecution when we're doing it. That's a definition of denying ourselves. The question is, are we willing to love people even if they view us as enemies with the love of Christ? And let's continue with Jesus' story. Here, in, starting with verse 5. It says, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and uh, their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, I will, uh, I will, uh, 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 it will all be yours. Sorry. And Jesus answered him, uh, "It was. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your your God, and Him only shall you serve." So, Satan's next attempt here is to tempt Jesus to worship him. But let's unpack this a little bit more. Here it says that Satan showed Jesus this moment of time. The word moment literally means a point, a dot. So Satan, out of all of man's history, out of this entire timeline of the human race, he picked this one particular moment and revealed this moment to Christ, right? Now, the scripture doesn't tell us exactly which moment he chose, but it does say that this is a moment where, it, where you can see a lot of power and glory from various kingdoms of the world. And Satan showing this to Jesus and offering this to him. But here's the thing, right, church? If we look back in our history, we see a lot of empires, and kingdoms rise and fall. But there's always one thing that associated every single kingdom that, that rose to power. Violence. Bloodshed. Human suffering. Destruction. Deceit. It's filled with them. It's not just all glory and power. Along with that comes all of this, these sins and human suffering. And Satan is telling Jesus, look, I'll give it to you. Not only will you receive this glory and power, but you can stop all of that right now. You can stop all of those human suffering right now. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. It's yours. You, you know, you, not only will you enjoy this glory and power, but you get to stop all this suffering. It's yours. You just need to worship me. Now he says, Satan says that it is his to give, that he has possession over all these kingdoms, and he could give it to whomever he want, he, he wished. Now, his claim is not entirely false. In John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus actually calls Satan ruler of the world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the apostle Paul called Satan the prince of the power of the air. He also called him the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. In other words, Satan is actively working right now in the world. He does have power and influence, but then we also know Satan has another name. His name is the father of lies. So yes, what he says is true, but it's not all true. There's another, another bit here, another piece here, and that is Satan, Satan's power is still within God's sovereignty. He cannot do anything without God's approval. Do you guys remember the story of Job? Satan couldn't touch him until he got God's approval. Do you guys remember the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis? In the book of Genesis, we, Joseph, his brothers betrayed him, sold him into slavery. 
years later, and he, was, he wound up in Egypt, and years later, he reunited with his family, and he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So, yes, Satan has, has influence, but it still remains within God's sovereign control. So what is the temptation here? What is the temptation here? Jesus is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. When Jesus returns, his kingdom will come. And when his kingdom comes, it, it will be full of glory, far more glorious than any of the glory of the kingdoms in this world. He will have power, and all of the tragedy and human suffering that we witness today will all vanish when his kingdom comes. But there's a problem, or at least something needs to come first, and that's the cross. Jesus has, had to go on the cross before this coming of his kingdom again. And this is the temptation that Satan has for, for Jesus. Take a shortcut. You don't have to get on the cross. You can have it now. You can solve all of this now. That's the second battleground for us. Don't settle for anything less than the kingdom of God. What Satan wanted Jesus to do is to settle for something less than, the, than his kingdom. Take what you can get now. And the truth of the matter is, church, if we don't settle for, for anything less than the kingdom of God, we will actually witness God's kingdom and its glory unfold before our eyes. We won't see it completely because we have to wait until Jesus return, but we can get a glimpse of it today. While I was in Lebanon, I got a chance to serve in uh, this church run by Pastor Kim. And I'm up, the, uh, up in the left corner, I was teaching a Syrian teenager how to play guitar. And um, so Pastor Kim, he's a pastor from Korea. He's been serving as a ministry, missionary in Middle East for 16 years. And for the past, I think six years, I believe, he's been mainly focused on uh, in Lebanon serving the Syrian refugees. So uh, he runs all sorts of programs at his church, helping uh, teenagers learn various skills so they could go out and work. Uh, actually, it's really hard for Syrian uh, families. Uh, people don't hire older, um, if, you know, older people to work. So a lot of young people have to go out and start working at a very young age. And so Pastor Kim is teaching these teenagers various skills so that they could find work. And after work, all these kids will come back to church and they have activities for them. They'll teach them English, teach them guitar, various things. And so, and besides this, these ministries at his church, Pastor Kim also started several elementary schools at those tent cities that you saw earlier. So this is a picture of one of those elementary school. This is during recess. And um, I th well, our kids here, we're really lucky. Oh, Patrick, you teach, so you, they, 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 during their recess, they probably have lots of games and, I don't know, monkey bars and various apparatus they could play on. Over there, they, they share maybe one or two soccer balls. And um, so what they do is they bring these giant speakers out, right, and they blast music. And these kids, they're very musical people, and they, they'll just start dancing. They'll just dan start dancing in circles, many, many, you know, different circles all over the so-called playground, really just dirt. And they'll just start dancing, and so our team just start dancing with them during re recess. And they're full of joy. They're so happy. So when Pastor Kim started his first school, one morning, again, these big giant dudes came up to him and said to him, you have to shut the school down and leave our tent city. These are, they were leaders, Muslim leaders of the tent cities. You have to leave right now. And they were very threatening. 
And do you know who came to the rescue? Who came to Pastor Kim's rescue? It's the parents. They stood between these leaders and Pastor Kim. And then they said, what have you done for us? What have you done for our children? This Korean man, he, his family left his home, came all the way here. He took our children and he's, he, he's, he taught them how to read and write. He fed them and he loved them. What have you done for them? And these leaders didn't come back. Then another time, this older gentleman came to Pastor Kim with 50 kids, 50 kids, and asked, Pastor, can you take these kids into your school and accept them as your students? And Pastor Kim was a little suspicious. I mean, when was the last time you see a man with 50 children coming to you? <laughs> he was very suspicious of what's going on. And, and he was hesitating. And finally, this man said, Pastor, Pastor, take these children. For the, in the past decade, we saw what ISIS can do, how destructive they can be. So, Pastor, take these children and teach them the Christian way. Teach them about the love of God and not the hate of God. Pastor Kim, this Korean pastor and his family, left his own culture, his country, to go to another part of the world. And what he saw was not just the Syrian culture or the Lebanese culture. What he saw was the glory of the kingdom of God unfolding before his eyes. He got a glimpse of the power of God and the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So we don't settle for anything less than the glory of God. That's the battleground. That's the second battleground. Let's continue. Verse 9. It says, And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so here, Satan took Jesus up to the southeast corner of the temple, which is the highest part of the temple. And overlooking that is the Kidron Valley. So if you fall from there, there's no way you could, you could survive. And so he took him up there and says, Why don't you jump? And here, Satan used Psalm 91 to tempt Jesus this time. He actually quoted the scripture. And Psalm 91 is actually a psalm about God's uh, protection of his people. It's about God being our refuge and our protection. And in the psalm, like, any, like many psalm, psalms, it's a song. And so it's written with a lot of metaphors and symbolism. And in the psalm, likewise, um, the writer, the author, used metaphorical language. And Satan deliberately misused scripture to tempt Jesus and here's, a, here's a, just a side note, brothers and sisters. You guys are contemplating on the word of God. We've got to learn to read scripture and interpret it. Lest we also be fooled. i share a little story, a stupid story, but it's a true one. So um, there's, a, there's a pastor, his name is Ed Dobson. Uh, he passed away with, um, because he caught, uh, he has a L ALS, and so he passed away already. But before he passed away, he uh, lived, he spent his, uh, he spent one year living like Jesus, and he wrote a book about it. And in his book, he talked about one time he was teaching in this, in this Bible school, and he was teaching Matthew chapter 5, uh, 6 and 7, you know, about the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And you remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, if, if, you're, if you're in a, one of your eyes causes you to sin, what do you do? You gouge it out. So at the end of the class, there's this young man that walked up to him with one eye. And this young man says, Sir, you know the verse that you, you taught? 
I practiced it. I tell you, it didn't work. I was a lust, lustful man before, and now I'm a left-eyed lustful man. <laughs> and, and Pastor Ed immediately looked at his hands. See, he chopped off one of his hands as well. We got to learn how to read scripture and interpret the scripture. All right. So what is the temptation this time? Well, um, Walter Lightfield, he's, um, uh, he wrote a commentary on the book of Luke. And when he got to chapter 4, he said that there are three kinds of temptations or testings. And these are actually interchangeable concepts. And he said this. He says that, number one, Satan tempts people. And the goal of Satan's temptation is to draw people away from God. That's his goal. But the same event that draws people away from God, God uses, can use that to test people. And the goal and the purpose of that testing is to bring people closer to God. But then there's a third way. It turns out that people can test God. People can test God. We can test God's truthfulness to his word. That's the temptation. Satan wanted to tempt Jesus on the truth of God's word. So when my, I have two children, they're all grown. My son is now 31, 30, 30 and my daughter is 26. Uh, but when my son was 10 years old, uh, there was a game that was really popular at the time. He wanted one badly and it's called Game Boy Advance. You guys have one? <laughs> Somebody's smiling so you must have one. <laughs> so he wanted one really bad and he asked for one and, and Alice and I, we took a long time, finally we relented, we gave him one. I, f I forgot it w w if it was for Christmas or birthday, but anyway we got him one. And so immediately we, we drew boundaries. You know, there are times when he could play and times where he couldn't play the game. And one of those would be bedtime. You know, once you pass bedtime, that's it. Game's got to be off. And then one night, I was walking around the house, and you know, his room was his door was open. You know, it was already past bedtime. It's dark, and then I saw this flickering blue light coming from within his room. I, so it turns out that you know he had his cover over him, and was playing in under his cover, and he got caught. <laughs> so I grounded his Game Boy Advance for a whole week, and. But then I was thinking, you know what? When I was a kid, I did the same thing. <laughs> I didn't have Game Boy Advance when I was a kid. I mean, you know, games, they're huge. You need a truck to move those games, and you need a quarter to play every time. But, uh, but what we had, we had comic books and novels. And I remember my parents told me that, you know, you shouldn't be reading in, in bed. You should not be reading in the dark. And yet, there I was with my blankets over my head and a flashlight, and I'm reading comic books and reading novels. I was doing the exact same thing. My son was testing my word, and I was testing my parents' word. And how many of us grown adults today, Christians, walking with the Lord, and yet we have blankets over our head, Testing the truthfulness of God's word. Jesus used Deuteronomy chapter 6, 16 to answer Satan. It says this. It says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him. And Masa. What's Masa? Well, it turns out that it's a word that came from Exodus chapter 17. And in Exodus chapter 17, again, we go back to, to, to the time when the Israelites were wandering in the, in, in the wilderness. They didn't have water to drink. And they were complaining. They were complaining to Moses. They were, they were demanding to have water. And so Moses took some elders with him, and they walked a, a little ways ahead to Mount Horeb. And they found a rock, and Moses struck the rock, and out came water for the people to drink. And when we get to verse 7 of chapter 17, we read this. It says, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, 
because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is he with, he with us? He said he would provide for us. He said it would take care of us. We don't even have water to drink. Is he really with us? They were testing the Lord whether or, no, or, or not that God was with them. But do you know where else God promised to be with us? Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, what? I am with you always. I'm with you always till the end of the age. And so the last battleground is don't test Jesus' promise to be with us always. Jesus is the Son of God, the creator of the world, of the universe. And just think about that. Jesus, I will be with you. I will be with you. In, the, in that verse we read earlier, God didn't say you need to have certain qualifications before you can go and make disciples. He says, just go. I will be with you. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that's enough? To have the Son of God, the creator of the universe, to be with us? Is that enough? I think so. I think so. So three things. We can, we, three battlegrounds that we'll face when we go and bring the gospel to the people around us. Number one, we have to practice denying ourselves. Put ourselves down. Number two, don't settle for anything less than the kingdom of God. We will see the glory of God unfold before us if we take that step. And number three, don't test Jesus' promise to be with us always. And in the end, I want to come back to this verse. Let me ask you to bow your heads and think for a minute. It says this, the pastor at Tire Church says, Christians should not give in to the blank. So I want to invite you to think about that blank. What might that blank be for you? Is it your colleague at work? Is it a neighbor, your neighbor across the street? Or is it a people group that you, 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 you've been too scared to approach? What is that blank to you? And think about this, but fight them with the love of Christ. Are you willing to love them with the love of Christ? Even if this blank may treat you as an enemy. So I'm going to give you just a minute to think about this. And pray that God will bring someone in your mind. What is that blank to you? And I'll close in a word of prayer after a minute. Heavenly Father, we come before you to present before you the image that the Holy Spirit had revealed in our hearts and minds. Whether we are seeing a particular face or people group, Lord, you've placed these people in our hearts and you're calling us to love them. So God, would you, would you strengthen our hands and feet? Give us the courage to love them with your love. As we witness how courageous, Lord Jesus, you, you, you were when you went on the cross. How you deny yourself because of your love for us. You suffered, you crucified, died, and buried. But yet, Lord Jesus, you resurrected from the dead. 
And now you're seated at the right hand of God, full of power and glory. And it is, and we trust that you will be with us when we do go. And so, Father, I ask that you open opportunities for us to engage the people around us. And pray that, Father, that we all will become channel of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name.